Uh, kia ora. Um, I apologise in advance for a bit of a cough that I've got uh, at the moment. I haven't been feeling very well and so I um, could well pause and cough and all sorts of things along the way. Um, but uh, this is just a brief overview of the rehab um, hot topics um, uh, topic uh, that I uh, shared um, last week. So person-centred or whānau-centred care um, and I guess I'm just really starting to think about this myself. What are the implications of um, thinking about um, <clears throat> providing care to whole whānau um, rather than to individual people? Um, so bear with me as I work my way through uh, this, this, these slides. Um, so I started by asking people, what are the characteristics of person-centred approaches? And the things that came up in the um, in the uh, chat were the collaborative nature, um, goals important to the patient, uh, shared decision making, uh, asking the client what's important to them, asking open ended questions and listening, uh, goal setting and shared decision making, uh, understanding cultural values and beliefs, um, providing individualized input, services connected at the right time, individual planning, holistic practice, respectful and responsive to the needs and the values of the individual, uh, holistic, uh, the client's voice, works around the patient's needs and collaborative. Uh, and so I think that's a, a lovely um, a summary uh, of some of the characteristics of person-centered approaches. One of the ways that I um, find it helpful to think about person-centered approaches is rather than sort of a overall um, <clears throat> response, I think can find it's often helpful to think about um, person-centered approaches at different levels of a system. Um, and this was an idea that Fee Graham um, really uh, got me started thinking about uh, when she was first teaching um, REHB 701. Um, and um, I'm now sort of taken over this idea. So thanks, Fee. Um, the idea is thinking about what does person-centered look like at an interaction level, at an intervention level, at an organizational level, and a values level. Um, and there's different ways of kind of I guess interrogating or critically reflecting on the ways that we think person-centered practice um, might uh, occur. So if you're going to do your own appraisal of where you think your own practice is, um, it can be quite useful to break it down in this way. Um, so you know, in terms of each of those different levels, where would you rate yourself on a scale of one to 10, the good old like it scale, um, with one being not great at all, and 10 being um, super duper? Um, you might want to think about the scale as being negative as well. There might be stuff around your organizational structure that's negative, that's actually harmful um, in terms of person-centered practice or the antithesis of person-centered practice if you're really honest there might be some stuff about the way that you do things as well or the way that you you your values it's a hard thing to be thinking about but it's worth trying to put a number on it and thinking about why that might be when I've taught this in the past different people have talked about these different aspects um here um thinking you know just some of the processes um systems within teams professional roles thinking about what care might look like and the ways that patients can experience choice and control and autonomy within the service so i think often people think about person-centered care from sort of an individual interaction perspective um, but i'm trying to get you to think a little bit more about broader systems and processes and the ways we work together um, <clears throat> and within services and how does that impact on people's experience of person-centered um, care. Um, I've, I've got a, um, a series of papers um, that I think are really helpful. I'm happy if anyone wants to get in touch with me individually to get copies of these if you can't access them yourself, uh, but try Google Scholar 
um, uh, to see if you can access a free uh, copy uh, anyway, because many of these are free um, open access these days. Um, so this is a scoping review um, and a thematic analysis of analysis of current literature that's um, around person-centered rehabilitation. And um, and this just, you know, really highlighting, this is um, a really useful paper, fantastic reading, and, um, we're in, but it is only summarizing what's currently in the literature. So um, I guess I'm going to be critiquing uh, what's available in the literature through the lens of um, this paper. Um, you'll see some people you might, some names you might recognise from within New Zealand uh, rehabilitation community. Um, and like I say, this person, this paper is well worth a read, fantastic. I've taken that um, model, which is circular, and put it into um, bullet points because it's easier to read rather than turning your head from side to side. Um, but um, they've looked at sort of three levels of the system, similar to what I was talking about before. So the, the person and the professional and the dyad, so the two, the two, the partnership, that how that interaction works between the two um, at a microsystem level and then at a macrosystem level. Uh, really what I want to highlight today is this microsystem level and um, this inclusive of significant others. Um, so <clears throat> this is some of the things that they found within uh, the literature around person-centered rehabilitation when they're trying to synthesize what's currently thought of in terms of person-centered approaches. So caregivers are sometimes care agents um, for people. Uh, when intimate relationships are addressed, the couple is the unit. Um, significant others may have a role in rehab planning. Um, if the person wants them to be involved, which cannot be taken for granted, and if the person is not coerced by any dominating relatives. Uh, then they, there's other mentions around significant others may contribute to rehab decisions um, when a person has cognitive or communication impairments. Um, and also that um, professionals sh um, should try to assure that the, the presumed best interests and re expressed desires or typical person premium preferences aren't overridden by significant others conflicting interests so when I read this it's quite transactional in terms of the role of significant others um, and it's there's quite a, a tone of negativity and that sort of caution around involving um, families and significant others in rehabilitation overall I would suggest um, and so I, I'm just thought that that was very very interesting so the you know the final sort of summary comment was with appropriate safeguards significant others should be integral part of PCR approaches beyond being mere bystanders adding a relational systemic approach to PCR practices so they're endorsing um, and um, it's a really good start uh, however I think when we're thinking about Fano centered practice we're really going to have to shift the lens through which we even start to look at these things. So I want you to compare this with a whānau order approach, which is as part of the health trans, um, system transformation within New Zealand, is being rolled out uh, at a national level. And we're thinking, this is just taken from the website specifically, um, have a look at what this tenor of this sounds like compared to the description of the involvement of significant others in person-centered practice. Um, so there's a lot about um, being the Fofano, uh, the family group as a whole, being decision makers and determining their own goals and aspirations, um, building on strengths and capacities and creating positive change and fully realizing confidence and mana and belief in self, family, and community. And when they talk about whānau centered, some of the characteristics they talk about is a holistic view of family well-being, uh, developing the whānau, developing their own solutions, um, building their capacity and resilience to become self-managing, um, and also supporting, uh, recognize that many whānau have complex needs and navigators might assist them in accessing integrated care and support. <clears throat> 
So um, the importance of whānau, of course, is, um, is uh, pretty clear in the Aotearoa New Zealand context. Um, I do, one thing that came up in the, the session is that I hadn't really described whānau um, particularly, and so I want to do that uh, a little bit today um, in, this, in this recording. So whānau is often translated directly as family, and so within a Western understanding of family, we think about a small contained family unit, um, often cohabiting, living together, uh, and so there's a tendency to think about family as that, but whānau is a much broader concept, um, and it can include family, um, but it also can include the the, the support people that um, uh, Māori have around them um, uh, in, in a range of different ways. And I'm going to pause for a minute because I found a nice um, definition the other day, so I'm going to pause this recording and go and find it. Okay, I've had uh, found it, and I've had a drink, and I've had a cup. Uh, so Fano, um, a definition that I've seen and used is extended family or family group. Uh, the term can also include friends who may not have any kinship ties to other members. Um, and so what I guess when I hear Māori talk about Fano, what I'm challenged to do is not assume who someone considers their whānau, ask, uh, and also it's a much, much broader concept and um, uh, support network, collaborative support network um, that isn't just um, there in a crisis, it is actually underpinning the well-being of the individual. The individual's well-being is deeply connected with the well-being of the group. Um, and I guess that centrality of Fano in terms of health and well-being can be seen in, in this, um, this paper, which has a, a quite an interesting table where they've looked at various Māori models of health and well-being. And if you look at um, Fano here, uh, bar one, Fano as a dimension of health and well-being is kind of the most universally um, considered aspect of health and well-being, and um, uh, so it's it's uh, an important concept for us to get our heads around. As Pakeha, it's not something I um, I'm just I'm just taking toddler steps in this regard, and so it's really today's just about raising questions, really. So really, you know, as I said, I've been thinking about what are the tensions that might be apparent when we try and sort of put our own understanding of person-centered rehabilitation within a whānau-centred, um, within whānau needs and aspirations. And can we even do that? Does the model itself not even work? Uh, and so in the presentation, I was um, hoping for some time for people to, to um, talk about what you think, but we ran out of time. Uh, so I'll, um, maybe you want to pause now and um, write down some of the things that you thought about as tensions. Um, uh, and I will also have a look and um, put some things, uh, talk about some of the things that I've um, noted. Um, but, uh, and I guess I was responding to some of these things particularly because I think when we're thinking about whānau-based um, care, some of these things are in direct conflict um, with some of these aspects of person-centred care. Um, um, but also, yeah, so I'll just leave it there. Have a, th have a think about that. I like to finish um, and, or make sure people, especially clinicians, have some resources to take away, to continue to think about, to reflect on in their own practice. Um, and I want to draw your attention to the Mehana model. Um, I've on this slide, I've um, linked the paper, which you'll see on the next slide as well. But there's also a link to a video presentation of Suze Pitama, who's one of the key authors talking about this model, which is a really, the video itself I found incredibly helpful to hear Suze be able to articulate um, the, the centrality of Fano in terms of health and well-being um, and the impacts particularly of these winds and currents um, on people, on the Fano's ability to move towards hauora. 
really recommend that video. Uh, this is a screen grab of the, the um, paper. Uh, what I would recommend is this, this appendix as part of the paper actually lists specific sort of um, questions or prompts that you could use to try and understand some of these concepts. And for me as Pākehā, I found this incredibly helpful to try and think, okay, so what does this mean? How do I translate this? How might I use this in my practice? So these prompts are very, very helpful. I want to draw your attention to the Physio New Zealand um, have, have uh, worked and come up with a, a person and whānau centred care model um, and have tried to consider the, the combination of both um, and have done you know, a really good job at that. So when you're perhaps thinking about your own practice at an individual level, at a service level, at a team level and at a values level, how, how are you measuring up against these things? If you were going to work on specific aspects of practice, what might they be um, to consider what whānau, um, whānau um, safe whānau care might be? Um, this is another framework that I found, um, which is more used in the mental health space, but I often find... Um, it's quite useful to look in other areas to see how, particularly areas where they've been thinking about whānau for a long time. And so this um, wellbeing outcomes framework, I think, is really interesting, um, particularly how they've tried to, um, I guess, uh, <clears throat> they're saying very clearly these are not direct translations, but they're trying to map and help um, help uh, link uh, outcomes and and how they might be for um, Pākehā and uh, a Tau Māori perspective. Um, so that's a really interesting um, document and it can be downloaded from uh, the He Ara Oranga or the mental health um, website. Uh, this is another one that I've recently um, uh, come upon, I can't find the link to it, sorry, I've looked online, um, but this was one that I was, because I was involved in some work with ACC, and um, this is a, a, a outcomes framework um, that they were using, and I'm not sure whether it's, um, they're using it more widely, but it, I found it really helpful to start to think about different outcomes, and, um, and what might um, whānau-centred outcomes look like, and one of the things that I might need to do, my team might need to do, my service might need to do, my own critical reflection might need to focus on that can support these whānau based outcomes. Um, so that was another um, resource that I thought uh, might be useful for people. Uh, once again, get in touch with me if, if that these um, are something you'd like to follow up with more. Um, you know, I, I have taken some of the ideas um, from that model, have put them into a matrix, and then um, what I suggest you can do is to start thinking about specific actions uh, that you might want to think about. And I guess it's moving from a conceptual sort of whānau-based care, what might that mean, down to what are the things that we might do within a service to move towards whānau-based or whānau-based services or services that are safe for whānau and are comfortable for whānau is, um, and, and actually achieve equity of experience for whānau, um, yeah, in, in, the, in the places that we work. So I encourage you to think about some steps and some actions that you can take. Uh, right, I'm going to pause this and um, have a look at some of the tensions that I was thinking about, see if I can find them. If I can't, I'll just finish it. Thanks, everyone.